Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. This is GearFest 2021. We've been celebrating music, we've been celebrating gear, and we have an amazing artist joining us right now. This is Divinity Rocks. So glad to have you join us here at GearFest. Hey, thanks for having me. It's nice to be here. So, uh, wow. Uh, I mean, all I can say is, wow, what an amazing career. And uh, you have to be one of the busiest artists that I've, I've talked to, just looking at all the things that you're doing, apparently simultaneously. It, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, you know, I think I'm some kind of mutant or something. I don't know. <laughs> like, things are crazy today, too. I have like eight hands or something. I don't know. Right, right. Let's take a little step back. We'll talk a little bit about uh, how you got into what you do and, and your, your playing and some of those things. And, and then maybe we'll get you to do a little playing for us and, and check out some of the tones and the gear that you're using as well. So we had a lot to talk about. Cool. Yeah. So do I understand correctly? You started on clarinet. Is that right? I did. Clarinet was my first instrument, my first love. Yeah? How did you make it from clarinet to uh, to the bass? Oh, man, that's a crazy journey. I'll make it super short. I played the clarinet from the time I was in the third grade till about the eighth grade. And uh, after the eighth grade, I fell in love with hip hop music. So I started writing raps. And I put the clarinet down in high school and focused on sports. When I went to college, I was going to be a journalist. And instead of becoming, a, well, I mean, I was studying to be a journalist at UC Berkeley and I picked up the bass guitar because I was hanging out with a bunch of musicians and I fell in love with it. And then I moved back to Atlanta and started playing all around town, places like Yin Yang Cafe and uh, it turned into Apache Cafe and little clubs all over. And I just fell in love with the bass and Right. became my main instrument. Was there someone or some bass line or some song that, that made you say, yep, that's it, that's the instrument for me? You know, it never was a, a, a song that made me realize the bass was for me. It was just the experience. I think the bass really chose me. Um, it was something that I was really good at immediately for some reason. I don't know where where that came from, but it, it was something that I was really good at and something that people recognized I was good at early on. And there have been a lot of people I could name who have been instrumental on my journey, who have championed me and pushed me and believed in me from Taurus Mateen to uh, Victor Wooten, who asked me to tour with him. Um, I will say that because I grew up in Atlanta, Outkast and Goody Mob and Dungeon Family were huge influences on my early bass playing. So it's funny because when I toured with Beyonce and I had the opportunity to take a solo and the solo was comprised of uh, like all of my favorite bass lines, the first bass line I started off with was this Outkast bass line. And this was a song they used to sing go me and you Yo mama and your cousin too Rolling down the strip on folks Blowing up, blowing Cadillac dough Slamming Cadillac dough So yeah, that right. was one of my favorite bass lines ever It was so simple, it was simple but it was funky And uh, and it was one of the first bass lines I learned how to play Right, right So I'm, I'm curious how you, uh, I, I want to get back to your career as well But of course you've you've uh, led me down another <laughs> rabbit hole here because uh, you know I hear the the playing and the groove that you're you're creating and you talked about learning that song. Tell me how you perceive a groove. Uh, are you are you uh, uh, for example when Bootsy Collins was here and I talked to him, he focuses on the one. That's what he's always aiming for. Is I got to hit the one and and or not hit the one and build from there. You know, and uh, different bass players key off of different things in the drum kit and so on. Tell us a little bit about how you approach groove. Wow, groove is such a very varied thing. For me, the one is extremely important. But before we even get to it, first I feel the groove. The groove is, it does something where it vibrates my DNA and it makes my body move. You know, I was just on a Zoom with the great Ella Jenkins. And as soon as we started talking about music and listening to music, my body started moving. And the first thing she said was, oh, your body reacts to music the same way that mine does. And I thought, wow, it was like a light bulb went off because that's where the groove comes from. It's this feeling you have immediately when you hear something. Then you start thinking, OK, now I got to be on the one. You know, James Brown talk about the one. Bootsy Collins talk about the one, the power of the one. The one is the most 
most powerful beat there is. And so if we can all get on that one, then we can all be in one accord. But when I think about groove and I think about that particular bass line, that bass line is on the one. One. Hey, hey, one. And it's almost like he accents the one every time. So, yeah, I mean, it's all about the one. Groove is just really something that you feel mm -hmm. for me. Right, right. And uh, speaking of groove, you mentioned uh, Victor Wooten there. Victor was just here the other day and we did an interview with him. Uh, he's, he's been to Sweetwater several times. And, and I know that you made a connection with him pretty early on and ended up playing bass with Victor Wooten, which is a crazy thing, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Yeah, Victor, uh, I went to Victor's very first base camp and the very first night of base camp, all these really anxious young bass players are, uh, are congregated in a room and Victor says, so tonight you're going to introduce yourself to the group by playing bass. That's crazy, right? So your heart <laughs> starts beating really fast. You start sweating and, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, wow, what am I going to play? What am I going to play? I was such a young new bass player, but I had been working on rapping and playing the bass at the time. So I asked Vic if I could rap and play because I knew that that would make me the most comfortable. And he said, you know, well, is that what you do? I said, yeah. So he said, okay, we'll do what you do. So I stood in front of the room and I immediately laid down a groove. <laughs> Hey, yo, yo, it's the D-I, the V-I, the N-I, the T-Y You want a B-I, baby, you can't see I, D-I, V-I, N-I-T-Y Somebody say I So I played this groove and this rap that I had written And after the camp, Victor asked if I could open up a show He actually asked, he called me and said, you know, do you have any more He asked, do you have any more uh, songs like that? And I'm like, yeah, man, I got a lot of songs like that I really only had one song like that, though, where I was rapping and playing, but I wasn't going to tell him that because right. I wanted to go on tour with him, right? right? So I got to writing a lot of songs after that, right. and I got to tour with the master, Victor Wooten, absolutely. Right. That's amazing. That, that's wonderful. So uh, following that, one of the next milestones, if you will, in your career was, of course, Beyonce. And uh, uh, I'd read that you actually weren't, uh, that you kind of had to be pushed to do the audition for that for that gig. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I didn't really believe that it was really, that it was a real thing. I figured that she already had the band and that she was just doing this for publicity, for a record. You know, she's such a big star and why would she be holding auditions for a band? But uh, my friends who are really good friends, they came over to the house and they refused to uh, to leave my house until I agreed to go to the audition. And I mean, most of it was that I was nervous I was scared. I was thought, you know, why would I be the person she chooses to to be in her band when there are so many other incredible bass players in the world? But I guess on that day, at that time, in that moment, it was me. Right, right. And so you you uh, obviously uh, played bass with her for for a number of years. We're musical director as well. And uh, <laughs> one of the things that's uh, come out of that is uh, the OGs. Yeah, the OGs. Yes, tell All us about the, uh, the OGs. <laughs> <laughs> the OGs, we call ourselves the the original all-female band of Beyonce, uh, consists of all the girls who were who were originally there from BB to uh, Kathy, Nikki, Marcy, Tia, me, um, shoot, and I hate naming our everybody because I always leave somebody out, and right. you know that's the worst. You got to look at the stage and like think who's uh, who's standing right here um Brittany yes Brittany Rie yes all oh, the girls in the back on the keys anyway um we just released a song last summer called Higher mm -hmm. we went to the women's audio mission studios in San Francisco and uh and recorded the song together and this is one of the first songs that we recorded together and it was a lot of fun we keep saying that we're going to do a project together but we're all so busy doing so many other things that uh, that hopefully we can make that happen one day. Right, right. So one of the things that uh, of the many that stands out to me in your playing and your music is your ability to rap and sing and play complex bass lines <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> Are you splitting your brain or how, how do you manage that? <laughs> I told you I was a mutant, man. <laughs> Am I splitting my brain? 
Hmm, that's a good question. You know, every time somebody asks me about that, I have a different answer about how I'm doing it. Mostly it is from, it's it's my subconscious. It's all of it is really happening in my subconscious. I'm not thinking about it. When you start thinking about it, the rhythm starts changing and, and you start messing up every time I start thinking about it. So rap for me, usually the rap is so deeply ingrained in my subconscious that I can do it when I'm doing anything. Uh, for instance, the song Rebel, I've been playing that song for so long that when I'm rapping and playing it together, I can be thinking about what I'm going to have for lunch and doing both of those things at the same time and not thinking about either one of the things that I'm doing. But when I try something new, I have to think about it. So it's with it's just like with anything. When you first sit down to try to play the major scale, you have to think about it. You know, but once you've been doing it for some time, it comes naturally to you and to your hands, your body. There's your brain is forming these synapses that knows what you want to do and it gives you all the tools you need to be able to do it. It sounds sounds simple, but it's not that simple. It takes a little bit of time. Right. So I usually tell students if they slow it down, whatever you're trying to play and wherever you're trying to sing or rap, slow it down so that you understand how the instrument is working with the vocal rhythmically. When you get that down, you can start to speed it up and it starts to become something that you do naturally. Right, right. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So continuing sort of along that vein, you're also a composer. You you write yep. a lot of music, and I, I'm going to talk about a couple of projects here in a second, but tell us a little bit about your approach to composition. Do you do it on the bass? Do you do it in your head, or how do you approach it? Well, it depends. I approach it in a myriad of ways. Songs are, you know, the songs come to you when you when you... Your intention is, my creative intention is to write songs and to write songs that empower and inspire people. And so those things kind of come to me out of, out of nowhere um, at, any, at any time. Sometimes when I'm sitting down and my creative intention is to make a song, then I'll sit down with the bass guitar and I'll just start playing anything. My favorite key probably is D minor. I don't know why. I just maybe it's because where it is on the bass age, I just start playing the bass. And then something happens where maybe I'll play a cool line and say, wow, that was cool. I'm going to write that down or I'm going to record it. Keep that idea. Um, and then once I do that, lyrics start coming, rhythms start coming, melodies start coming. And I just I just go with everything that comes. I just write it all down, get it all down, record it, whatever it is. And then I come back and I try to organize it later. But I allow the organization to happen much later when I'm being conscious about it. Songwriting for me is a very unconscious act. I'm not really thinking about it. I make up songs as I'm walking into the house to greet my dog, for instance. Right. I have a dog named Lala. She has 20 million songs. Every day I walk in, there's a new song for her. And I approach songwriting in that same way. I just allow the music to come to me and speak through me. And then I organize. And then there are some songs that are not great. So I don't, nobody ever hears them. And then there are some songs that are amazing that I think are amazing. And I craft them and I chip away until they become something presentable. Mm -hmm. In the course of that process, are you creating a demo in the computer? Are you just uh, doing a, you know, just a, a skeletal kind of thing that you'll then flesh out later? Or how do you approach that? Yeah, it depends on how much time I have. If if I have a really great idea or something that I think is a really great idea, then I go into, okay, I write, a, for instance, one of the last things I wrote was a really cool bass line. So I laid the bass line down, but then I started thinking about the production of it, which can be good and it can be bad because it can hinder the creative process to start thinking about the production. But I had these ideas about the effects that I wanted to happen in the bass line. So I added those things, added it, just opened up a DAW, I think Logic or something. So I laid down a little demo. Then I pulled up some drum sounds, started beating away at the drums, pulling up some MIDI drums, for instance, laying those things down. And then I just sit back and groove to it for like 20 minutes and start thinking about the rap and the concept and all those things. Lay down a couple of little ideas vocally and sit back and jump around the room and dance and be like, oh my God, this is amazing. And then call my wife in. It's like, listen to this amazing thing that I made. And she says, well, it's okay. Cause it's not quite flush out, right? right. <laughs> it's like a newborn baby, right? They're not that cute. 
Not always. <laughs> so then after some time, you know, spending time just listening to it, then I start to flesh it out. So, yeah, then I start to add the bells and the whistles and chip away and maybe re-record the bass because maybe I didn't have um, the right tone dialed in or something, you know. So then I start putting my producer ear on and thinking about the song as something to present to the public. Mm -hmm. How much does the, the tone of your bass affect what you play? Oh, it affects how I feel about what I'm playing, if that makes sense. Sure. So if I'm dialed into a really, really, if I got a really good tone dialed in, then I feel good and I feel like stretching out and I feel like I can make the bass do anything I want it to do, make the sound sound clean and clear and crisp and it inspires me to sh go for things that maybe I wasn't going for before. But if I have a little flubby sound, <laughs> <laughs> That's not that inspiring to me. So maybe I'm not as uh, as articulate and maybe I'm not as clear about my ideas and maybe I'm not as inspired because the sound isn't inspiring me. You know, sounds inspire us as, as musicians. I was just in Mexico and the birds are so cool because they're they're singing something that I never heard before. The melody they're singing was something I hadn't heard and I couldn't kept trying to get my phone to capture it but every time I tried to capture it they would stop singing but it was so inspiring and I started whistling it and then, then I started thinking about grooves around it and other melodic ideas and so I think tone and sounds really uh really help us as musicians uh get to um get to whatever it is we're trying to get to as creative people right so I, I, uh, I'm always curious, uh, talking to drummers and bass players in particular, because the groove is so focused in, in, uh, in those two areas, how much do you adapt your playing to work with a different drummer? <laughs> and how much do you say, this is what Divinity does? <laughs> that is a really great question. Hmm. And there are a lot of factors that would influence both of those things. So yes, there are times when I am going to adapt to the drummer because maybe of the environment I'm in, maybe I'm at a jam session or something and I don't have any control over what's happening. But then I do have a little bit of control, right? So I think to myself, hmm, I want this drummer to play this groove a little bit differently. So then I start playing a little bit differently and try to pull the drummer over to what I'm doing <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so that we can meet in the middle somewhere. You know, if I wasn't particularly feeling how they may have been grooving, then I'll try to adjust what I'm playing to kind of pull them into how I want to want to groove on top of something. Uh, drummers can be very stubborn, though. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then there are times when... When I'm when I'm very clear about establishing what it is that I want and I think it becomes obvious, you know, when we're on the bandstand, we are having a conversation and that conversation can go a number of ways can go. Hmm. That's an interesting thing you're doing over there. Let's see if I can get you to do this. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, no, nope. That's not it. That's not it. Come, come back over here, you know. And and the drummer could be saying, well, I like where I'm at. And I don't know what you're doing over there, but I'm not coming over there to where you are, you know. <laughs> so sometimes you got to compromise. When I'm playing my shows, I don't really have to compromise because it's my music. It's the songs that I've written and I know how I really want them to be played. Uh, I do have a really fun drummer. Uh, his name is Lamar Moore. And he and I have this uh, this thing on stage where we push each other in a very fun and exciting way. And we also are in conflict in some ways uh, on stage. And that adds an excitement to the music that I believe the audience really feels. And it, get, it gets, gives them that uh, not conflicted energy, but it's kind of like... It, it arouses the energy in the room if he and I are kind of going at it. You know, like I'm thumping my behind off and he's shedding his butt off and he's like hitting the hi-hats really hard and he's like, we're just going at it. And you know, like, I, d I don't even know how to describe it. It's just this really intense conversation we're having, this push and this pull and, and, and it is a conversation. And sometimes we are in 
we are battling for for control because we're both just like that. <laughs> right. We're both just bumping heads, you know. Um, but that can be a lot of fun to to play to play with him. He he's an exciting drummer to play with. I like to play with exciting drummers. Drummers really inspire me. Drummers can push you. I love playing with Nikki Glaspie because she's always approaching that groove like she own it. You know, I love to play with drummers who are playing hard, who are playing, you know, rhythmic and doing tasty little things because all of those things inspire you to add some some variety to your playing that you may not have even thought about adding, you know? So right. I hope that answers your question. I feel right. like I went on a tangent. No, no, that was, that was awesome. That was great. That was great. <laughs> so I have to ask about one of your recent ongoing projects, the Div Rocks Kids. Yeah. Uh, such cool songs and videos and things that you're doing there. Tell us about that project, where that came from and how you approach the music to it. Wow. Divi Rocks Kids is a, is a newly formed project. And uh, it's something that I always thought I would do when I was older. I don't know. You know, we get these things in our minds that, you know, I'm going to write children's songs and music and books and things like that when I'm older. And so I had been, you know, when I sit down and I'm in my creative space, I had these little diddlies all around, uh, songs that I had played and, you know, ideas and skeletons that I had been working on for that time, whenever that time came, uh, that I would, you know, share with the world. I had actually released a children's song called I Could Be Anything back in 2001. Hmm. But again, you know, I'll do that when I'm older. It's funny how this pandemic for a lot of musicians brought a, brought those side projects, those projects you had been, you know, thinking about doing back to the forefront of your mind, right? Because all of a sudden, all the things that we had planned had been taken away from us quickly and there was nothing we could do. So the kids' music sort of presented itself to me in an interesting sort of way. And it was uh, through a friend of mine who needed some kids music for a project that, that he was working on. And I said, oh, I've actually been doing some of that. So I sent over some of my sketches and he loved them. And we ended up licensing some of that music. And after that, I thought, man, I really should consider this as something to do now and not something to do later. Because what better time is there than now? So I uh, put, you know, I just put all my resources into it. And uh, and now I'm sharing it with the world. You know, you just kind of got to put yourself out there. Right. The thing I love about this project is that it is in line with my mission as an artist. My goal and mission as an artist has always been to inspire and empower people through music. What better way? to inspire and empower people um, than sharing music with kids and with the kid in everybody. I, I love it. I mean, I, th I thought it was great. Thank so I, I don't think you have to be a, of a certain age to enjoy it. I think it's, I think it's awesome regardless. So very, very cool stuff. Very cool stuff. Yeah. One of the other things I noticed uh, that you're working on is a bachelor degree. Is that correct? <laughs> You've been doing your homework. I love it when people do their homework, man. <laughs> so I, I, I just have to wonder when, when Divinity Rock shows up for class, you know, what is what does everybody say, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're doing online classes, which is really cool. I have had a couple of people, you know, hit me up in the DM like, I can't believe I'm in a class with you. <laughs> I'm like, I can't believe I'm in a class with you. Um, yeah, you know, it's it was really a personal goal for me. A few years ago, I embarked on the journey to get my bachelor's degree because I finally found the right Berkeley for me. I went to UC Berkeley to be a journalist. But what I didn't realize was that I should have always gone to Berkeley College of Music. Right. <laughs> um, education has always been important to my family and to me. And, um, and I dropped out of Berkeley to be this bass player. I didn't get my degree. So it was something that I always just, I really wanted to do. And there were some things that I wanted to learn. Um, I wanted to learn more about production. I've been, you know, delving into the world of production for a number of years now, but there were some real technical things that I feel like I didn't have a, a, a good handle on. 
and uh, and Berkeley College of Music, the way the program is set up, it is it is set up. The online program is set up for people who are working and have uh, lives and who are operating in the music industry right now. And so it's been really helpful to kind of get some of those things that I don't think I had before, you know, that I that I needed to to, to brush up on. So I'm excited. I graduate next May. And if you all want to come to the graduation and party with me, please do, because it's going to be fly. Believe me. <laughs> I really believe it's going to be the first in-person graduation next year, 2022. So nice. I'm excited. That's, I'm excited. Uh, that's awesome. Well, congratulations on that. I, I think that's that's absolutely awesome. And you mentioned learning about production and some of the things there. And we were talking before the cameras were rolling that you've been learning some of those things and, and working. You, you do a lot of work there in your home studio. Talk a little bit about how you set your gear up so that you can be creative. Mm, wow. So oh, I just got this Apollo X8. I love it. It's my interface. Um, I have this um, this Avalon U5. I usually plug my bass into it uh, when I'm when I'm really ready to record some bass. And I have this really incredible studio desk. I got the Yamaha H7s right here. I got a pretty pretty cool monitor right here. I'm using my MacBook Pro laptop. I got a whole bunch of <laughs> hard drives over here. Um, my setup is pretty simple. And I have a MIDI keyboard down here. I got a keyboard there. I got basses and guitars everywhere. This room is set up for creativity. When I step into this room, my intention is to be creative and to be empowering and inspiring through my creativity. So I usually can easily plug my bass up into this Apollo, pull up uh, Pro Tools or Logic and just go for it. I have this, uh, I love this microphone. It's actually a really good microphone. This SM7B plugged into um, channel one. The bass is going into channel two. I got this baby going into channel three or four. I got some other gear going. Yeah, man, I just, I just plug and play, plug and groove. It's so easy to have a home studio these days. I also have an Apollo Twin that I travel with. I also travel with this microphone. I travel with the bass, travel with the computer. Um, I'm a voiceover artist, so I always need a great microphone with me and a bass and a little MIDI keyboard with me everywhere I go in case I want to create. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty simple, simple little setup. I think one of the most important and most overlooked items in studios is your studio desk. I have this really cool studio desk that is set up for success. As soon as I sit down, I flip on the Furman, fire up the Apollo, plug in the bass, turn on the computer, and I'm ready to go. Right. Nice. And that's that's key, right? To be able to get into uh, the creative flow very quickly. Quickly. Yes. Without, uh, you know, that's the one thing I love about the Apollo is console. Console is, a, is an incredible piece of software. If some of you don't know. And it works like a mixing console, like an analog mixing console. And it interacts with your DAW, whether no matter what DAW it is. You can configure console in so many different ways uh, that help you with your creativity and you can save those settings. So I can go into console and set up pretty much anything I need. Because when I take the Apollo Twin on the on the road, for instance, it's a completely different setup than having the X8. And the other thing I like about the Universal Audio System is that I can also I can have the Apollo here, the X8, and connect the Twin and get 10 channels, although I don't need 10 channels in here. Yeah, it's, it's vital just to have that set up so that you can, you can get into action. And the other aspect for a bass player is uh, something we definitely want to talk about, and that's the bass amp, because Aguilar oh, yeah. is the sponsor of you being here at GearFest with us. <laughs> I cannot wait to get on stage with this amp and turn it up and go ham. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a show coming up July 20th in Tenafly, New Jersey. It's going to be my first live performance after quarantine. And I've just been imagining taking this amp and plugging it in and just ripping with my band. I mean, everybody's probably playing loud and fast right now. 
<laughs> and we will be we won't be the exception. We're probably gonna play a little loud and a little fast when we first hit the stage, but then eventually we'll calm down and it'll make it about the music. <laughs> right, right. That's awesome. Well, we're so grateful, to Aguilar, for uh, for uh, sponsoring you being here, and uh, so grateful for your time today. We appreciate you sitting down with us. Uh, like I said, you're one of the busiest artists I've uh, I've ever interviewed. So thank you very much for taking time for us. Ah, oh, that's very sweet. Thank you very much for having me. Um, shall I play just a little bit? I wish you would. Yeah, that'd be awesome. I'm gonna play my signature. Actually, I'll I'll sign off and I'll let you do some playing, and we'll wrap it up. <laughs> Some people were born to lead, others are born to follow. Some people were born to spit it, others are born to swallow. Some were born to make the rules, others are born to break it. Some people were born to dish it, others are born to take it. I was born to make it better with the fire, but never will I. Let them take me, let them make me, cause I know it's a lie. I'm a rebel when I'm right, you say we monsters aside. If you look into my eyes, what you can see, the strongest what me and the boost, but in the truth. The trouble with you, the fall in the need of a parachute. All you want is loot, but look the crew to execute. Anybody, if they cause a dispute, we'll screw you. We'll take it to the streets, cause we all bear arms. Take it to the police, cause sometimes they spread harm. They be communities where the sun ain't warm. In the midst of the storm, we resist when they bomb. I'm a rebel, but you put it to this metal, baby. It ain't no other who can bring it on this level, baby. I go to war every day with the devil, baby. Cause I'm a rebel, baby. I'm a rebel, baby. Yo, I'm a rebel, but you put it to this metal, baby. It ain't no other who can bring it on this level, baby. I go to war every day with the devil, baby. Yo, I'm a rebel, baby. baby, 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 baby. Check me out, check me out, Miss Rock. I only, I only rock, only rock hip hop.